My name is Isa Kohler Hausman, and I am presenting the paper for um, our pair, Lily Hugh, um, which is sort of ironic because she is actually getting a PhD in applied math and computer science, and I barely know how to turn on a computer. So we're here today talking about what makes algorithmic tools biased or discriminatory. And some have argued that we can only answer that question by inquiring about causal questions. Why? Well, let's start with this very familiar example to many of you probably because um, it's used frequently in Judea Pearl's writings on this question. Um, if we look at just disparities, we realize, of course, it's indeterminate as to the normative question. Right? The statistics alone don't tell us whether or not this pattern is an instance of discrimination because if you look at the university level, this was a 1973 study of admissions at Berkeley, you see that, um, <clears throat> that more people sex-coded male are admitted and less people sex-coded female are admitted, but if you control for or stratify at the department level, that disparity disappears. So again, this suggests that we need some connection between the category and the outcome other than merely this observed pattern to determine whether or not it's discriminatory. And one candidate that has become particularly popular through the work of Judea Pearl is to think of social kinds as causes and that that's the relation that we're looking for. And so discrimination exists when there's a causal relation of some yet to be determined type between the category and the outcome. That is, Pearl and many others suggest that to know what makes this observed relation discriminatory, we have to start by thinking about this causal question. So he suggests we should draw a DAG, or a directed acyclic graph. <clears throat> and this is supposed to illustrate the causal structure that underlies the data generation. Now from what I understand, as I said, I'm a complete neophyte to your field, there's huge debates, of course, about uh, which pathways should be considered discriminatory or unfair, what the structure of the DAG should be, what the content, what the directionality should be, but we're not here to debate that. In fact, what we want to ask and question is their entire ontological premises of what it means to draw a diagram like this for social kinds like gender. So to draw something like this basically implies, we're gonna say at least three things. So first, is that the nodes can be thought of as things that exist independently of each other. Um, in the paper, we, although Pearl uses gender, we replace that with sex because, as will hopefully become clear, we're not sure what's left conceptually in this node anymore once you put all the sort of indirect effects of sex out there as a separate node. So one is an assumption that these things exist independently of each other. The second is that the relations between them, what's referenced abstractly by those arrows are causal relations. And the third is that those causal relations are modular, and that's the one we really focus on. So what does modularity mean? Modularity basically means that each cause and effect pair has its own pathway, which is equivalent to saying that it's theoretically possible that we can go in and surgically intervene on one node, and it doesn't disrupt the causal dependencies in the system. So the causal force that gender exists, exerts, excuse me, on admission exists independently of the causal force that gender exerts on uh, department choice. So this, this requirement, this assumption of modularity is really essential to this whole line of work because without it, we can't have the concepts of direct and indirect effects, right? If sex were just this sort of lumpy, fat-handed cause, then anytime you changed it, everything downstream also had to change. So without modularity, we can't isolate or pick apart some indirect effects from others or even distinguish direct from indirect effects, which Pearl seems to think is actually essential. From, if from my reading of his work, it seems to be that he thinks that the proper formalization of what Title VII, for example, the federal anti-discrimination statute, prohibits is uh, just the direct effect of sex, which I can't help but being a pedantic law professor, it's not clear to me that that's the right formalization of Title VII, but that's a separate issue. So what's the problem? Well, we just don't think that the category of gender is modular in this fashion. We think it's a theoretical mistake, or most of the categories that we're concerned with being the object of discrimination. That is, in a counterfactual world where the entire pattern of application to departments changed by gender, suddenly, let's say, all people sex-coded male applied to art history departments, and all people sex-coded female applied to math departments, is not a counterfactual world. In that world, 
I think it's theoretically improbable that this cause-effect relationship, the direct effect of sex on an admission, would remain invariant. Which is, as I take it, the entire point of federal anti-discrimination statutes, right? The reason we care about intervening up here is because we think it's going to change the social meaning of those categories. So in the paper, we try to motivate this intuition that they're not modular by thinking about another social type, let's say a religion like Catholic. So if you draw a diagram like this and you say, well, look, Catholic causes belief in the Holy Trinity, causes uh, attendance at mass on Sundays, causes belief in papal infallibility, modularity holds that we could intervene at the social level, right, with our due operator, and set the, the value of, of uh, rituals instead equal to Sunday church to Saturday temple. And what modularity holds is that the relationship between Catholic and these other cause-effect pairs would be invariant, could be, theoretically. And furthermore, that the social meaning of Catholic, so its capacity to serve illicit meanings in the world, would also be invariant to that uh, intervention. And we can only motivate our argument in this uh, eight-minute presentation. Um, and we're happy to send the whole paper. It's not on the World Wide Web. But if you contact us via uh, electronic mail, we're happy to send it to you in that format. Um, so you might be thinking, all right, look, if we can't think of this term because of sex, which is a statutory language in Title VII, as being caused by sex, then what the hell does it mean? Well, here, as in elsewhere in life, I think that um, the philosophers Beyonce and Taylor Swift really help us. And I'm not just being flip here. I, I actually really mean that I think this intuition, we, we think about it constantly. So when Taylor Swift sings in this song, if I were a man, they wouldn't you know, ask whether or not I deserve my fame. They would separate my power moves from me being a, a woman. Um, she says she would just be like Leo and Saint Tropez. And when Beyonce says, if I were a boy, I could kick it with who I wanted and I wouldn't get confronted for it. They're not saying that having some sort of inherent physical feature mechanistically propulses certain behaviors, nor are they saying that, that, that it just causes like this behavioristic trigger of perceptions. What they're saying is that the category of masculinity is the category that makes one be perceived as, by virtue of which. What it is to be perceived in that category is to be perceived as a deserving player when one has success and multiple sexual partners. And what it is to be in the category female is to be perceived as not deserving success. And it's promiscuous when one has multiple sexual partners, right? What Beyonce is saying is to be in the category male is to not be confronted for when and with whom one kicks it. So what, what they show us, what, and, I, and I really mean this very seriously, what I think is just actually very intuitive in, in phrases like this, is that these meanings are in the category. They're not separate and downstream from it. So let's go back to Catholic. I, if we had to draw something, which obviously um, <clears throat> I'm not very good at, I would draw something like this weird bubble with bubbles inside it and say that, you know, when we act on a category like Catholic, a socially constructed category like Catholic, we act on one that's constituted by the very things that the DAG represents as being ontologically distinct and causally downstream. Just as when we act on the category of gender, we act on a category that is made by social facts about beliefs about presentation, occupational choice, caregiving, etc. And these social facts explain precisely why, and this is why I might respectfully disagree with the, the keynotes um, point on this, why we're concerned with discrimination on the basis of these categories and not other categories, like having a bunion or not having a bunion. There's something that's distinctively wrongful precisely because of the social arrangements that give the category the meaning. Um, and I'm out of time, but I just want to say, because I'm in a room of computer scientists, that we don't think this is something that's limited to the computer science approach to discrimination. I think that this conceptual mistake underlies the entire field of labor economics. Uh, so we've got a lot of other people we're going to have a great relationship with, which is the, you know, the taste based versus statistical discrimination from Gary Becker onwards. And of course, the entire colorblindness approach to the Equal Protection Clause characteristic of John Roberts. So we look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks so much. Thank you.